Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming. My name is Stuart Sierra. I work for a company called Relevance, and I'm here to talk about Clojure, and more importantly, Clojure Script. So first of all, just a quick introduction. What is this mysterious thing called Clojure? Well, Clojure is a fairly new, dynamically typed, Lisp-like language for the Java Virtual Machine. It compiles to Java bytecode, it runs on the JVM, and it's organized around the ideas of functional programming, immutable data structures, and built-in support for shared memory concurrency. So this here is a whirlwind introduction to closure syntax. Uh, every expression is wrapped in parentheses, like any Lisp. This little example here starts with a namespace declaration, NS, that's saying we're in the namespace java1.examples, and then it has one function definition. Defun defines a function, average is the name of the function, and nums is the argument to this function, and the ampersand means that this function takes any number of arguments, so it has variable arity. And then you just read expressions from the inside out. They're nested. So the innermost expression in this example is reduce plus nums. That's calling a function called reduce, and plus is actually the name of another function that's being passed as an argument. So we're passing the plus function into the reduce function. And that's going to use the plus function to reduce over this collection of numbers that we've passed in. So it's going to call plus on the first two numbers and then take the result of that, call plus on that in the next number, and so on, until it gets the final result, which will be the sum of all the numbers that we passed in here. And then it's going to divide that by the count. So again, this is a list. We have prefix notation. The slash is the division function. So we're dividing the sum by the count to compute the average of a group of numbers. Now, you'll notice, of course, this is a dynamically typed language. We don't have any type declarations. So if I call the function average with exact integer arguments down there, I get an exact answer, in this case, a ratio. If I call it with floating point numbers, I get a floating point result. And I could also do that with uh, arbitrary precision integers or big decimals or anything else. So just as a very quick comparison, you can see this is what this piece of code would look like if we were writing it in a more typical language. I use Java as the example. Now in Java, of course, everything has to be in a class, so this function would have to be wrapped in a class. It has to be statically typed, so the Java version only works on uh, an array of doubles. And it's got some explicit for each looping, and then it returns a result. Um, the point of this example is that if you hear a lot of complaints about Lisp-like languages, that they have lots of parentheses, parentheses all over the place, it's not really that there are so many parentheses, it's just that they're in a slightly different place than you're used to. So if you actually count up the braces and the brackets and everything else, you'll see there are just as many in the Java example. We just use different kinds and we use them in slightly different places. So that's all I'm going to tell you about Clojure. You're experts in Clojure now. So Clojure script is a compiler which is written in Clojure, so it also runs on the JVM, and it compiles Clojure script, which it turns out is very similar to Clojure, into JavaScript. It takes Clojure script source code as input and returns JavaScript source code as output. And that's everything you need to know about Clojure script. So the rest of this talk is going to be about why you would want to do this. Why do we want to compile into JavaScript? Why do we want to use Clojure? And why is this interesting? First of all, why JavaScript? Why write a language that targets JavaScript as a compiler, besides the fact that all the cool kids are doing it these days? And the answer is because it's there. 
I mean, you can't get away from it. It's in your web browser. It's in every kind of phone, whether you've got an Android phone or an iOS phone. They both do JavaScript. It's in servers and databases. It even shows up in set-top boxes and other kinds of embedded devices. JavaScript just keeps popping up. It's very frequently the only executable code technology that's available in some given environment. So if you want to go someplace, JavaScript is going to take you there. Some people even go so far as to call JavaScript the assembly language of the web. And I didn't come up with this. Some very, very bright people doing a lot of work with JavaScript have agreed to this. This picture here is what you get if you do view source in Gmail. Now, obviously, that was not written by hand, and it was not intended to be read by a human being. So this has been going on for a while. People are compiling things into JavaScript and treating it as a, an execution target, as a platform. Uh, in fact, uh, someone, I think it was uh, Brendan Eich, did an experiment, and he discovered that if you take this compressed JavaScript source, and then you compress it as text using gzip or something, you actually end up with something not much larger than x86 machine code that gives you the same effect. So this is actually a fairly efficient way to distribute applications. Uh, last week, I was at the Strange Loop conference where Brendan Eich, the father of JavaScript, uh, gave a talk about this language that he wrote in 10 days and has been trying to fix ever since. And this is his slide. He said, you can always bet on JavaScript. Every time someone says JavaScript can't do something, people will figure out a way to do it because, as I said, it's there. The only thing wrong with JavaScript, really, I mean, the only problem it has is it's JavaScript. You know, it's, it's a weird language, and it, it sort of shows that it was developed very quickly and then didn't have any standard or careful design process. And Brendan Eich admits this. You know, there are all sorts of weird edge cases, especially in the syntax and how things get converted to different types. There's a presentation by Gary Bernhardt called Watt, where he just goes through all the weird things that JavaScript does. And there are actually reasonable explanations for most of them, but still, there are a lot of these little details that you have to keep in your head if you want to write JavaScript directly. And over time, you know, in a small app, they're not going to bother you very much, but as your applications get bigger and more complex, they're going to become more and more of a burden to remember. So why closure? Why would we want to write JavaScript programs in Clojure. Well, Clojure is a very small language designed around a few very essential ideas. And the biggest one is this, immutable persistent data structures. There are four basic data structures in Clojure. This is what they look like, list, vector, map, and set. And all of these data structures are immutable. That means that when we modify something, we don't actually modify it. We create a new version of it that has some changes in it. So just as a very quick example, if I define a map, a map goes from keys to values, like a dictionary or a hash table. I can then call a function, in Clojure it's called associ for associate, to add another key and value onto that map, and I get a new map back, but I haven't actually changed the original map. And this immutability is very important for concurrency, which is one of the things Clojure was designed for. Now, that doesn't show up so much in JavaScript, but it's still surprisingly helpful. Think about uh, callbacks or event handlers, anything where you don't know when your code is going to run. It's so much easier when you don't have to worry about data just changing out from underneath you. Another thing Clojure is built around is this idea of manipulating data structures as the core operations of your program. So there are, is the, there's a very rich library of functions in Clojure for manipulating these data structures, keeping their immutable properties. And here are just a couple of very small examples. I could take uh, the function range, which returns an infinite sequence 
of integers. It's only infinite if I try to read all of it. As long as I don't use it all, it's fine. Then I can filter that to get just the even numbers. Then I can take just the first hundred of that infinite sequence of even numbers and then call that reduce function again to compute the sum of all those numbers. So you think about that problem. That's something that might take several lines and a couple of different loops in a conventional programming language. It boils down to just a single line in a data-oriented language like Clojure. A little more complicated, I've written a little one-line program to count the occurrences of vowels in a piece of text. I slurp in the piece of text from a file and then run a regular expression. That hash quote is syntax for a regular expression to find all the vowels and return them in a big infinite sequence and then call another library function to compute how often each of those vowels occurs. So you can see there are about 11,000 O's, 15,000 E's, and so on. So Clojure is a very expressive, very powerful language. And this is uh, a thing that people will say after they've learned Clojure. They say, I got into it for the concurrency, but I stayed around for the data structures. This is really a liberating kind of way to program. But there are lots of other, maybe less significant features in Clojure that are things that are lacking in JavaScript. A simple example are functions with different arities, the same function that we can call with different numbers of arguments. Now in JavaScript, you can kind of fudge this. You can use the arguments array that's not really a, an array, but you know, you can make it work. But in ClojureScript, we can actually define a function and give it different arities. So this function, greet, can be called with no arguments, and then it prints hello world. It can be called with one argument, a name, and it says hello name. Or it can be called with two arguments, and it mashes those two arguments together into a single string. And we can also reuse the same function with different arities of itself. This is a quick way to get default arguments in Clojure. There are rumors that ECMAScript 6 might have multiple arity functions, but you know, why wait? This works right now. Another feature Clojure has that turns out to be very helpful in JavaScript oriented programming is namespaces. We all know JavaScript doesn't have namespaces or modules and there are all these little tricks that you do to actually get privately scoped functions and sort of isolate your code from other pieces of code. In ClojureScript, we don't have to worry about that. We create a namespace, we declare it at the top of a file, and then every function in that name, in defined in that file, will belong to that namespace, and it will not clash with any other functions. This is safe, and it works. Another really interesting feature, and this is something that exists in both Clojure and ClojureScript, it's called protocols. A protocol is a little bit like an interface. We define it, we say def protocol, give it a name. This is one of the core language protocols. It's called I counted. And it has a single function, count. Now that defines a function, count, in this namespace, CLJS core. And it defines a function but doesn't give it any implementation. So then we can do a couple of different things with that. We can create a new type, in this example, a type called array chunk that has a few fields, array, offset, and end. And we can provide an implementation of that protocol for that type. Now this is pretty much conventional object-oriented style programming here. We've created an interface and we've created uh, a concrete type that implements that interface. But the other thing protocols can do is that they can be extended to types that you don't control. So the language itself actually does this. We want the count function to work on JavaScript's built-in array type. And we can do that by extending that type to the protocol that we've defined. So this is a slightly more flexible way of dealing with interfaces and inheritance than the more conventional ways. This is actually extending the definition of the array type, but 
it's doing it in a namespace. So it's not creating uh, new functions on the array prototype that are going to clash with other libraries and other code that you might net load. Finally, Clojure was designed for concurrency. In particular, it was designed around a particular way of doing concurrency where you have controlled access to mutable state. Remember we said all the data structures in Clojure are immutable, everything doesn't change, but we can define things that we allow to change by replacing their state. So the simplest version of this and the one that ClojureScript includes is called an atom. We can create an atom, give it some immutable data structure as its initial state. We can dereference that atom, that's what the at sign means there, and get the state back out. Then we can call a function swap and tell it to change the state of this atom. We're actually creating some new state by giving it a function to call on the previous state. So basically, state enclosure is always a transition from one immutable data structure to another immutable data structure. And it does that by calling a function. So this function, update in, is going to look at a map, find a particular value at a particular key, and then call another function on it. So this data structure, this map has two scores in it. Lee and Terry both have scores in some game they're playing. And we're going to add seven to Lee's score, and then the new state of the atom scores is the updated map. Now the name atom comes from atomic because in a multi-threaded world there's a promise that that change will be atomically visible to all the threads that might be looking at that atom. Now in ClojureScript, uh, we're compiling to JavaScript where there are no threads, so this isn't as much of an issue, but it's still a surprisingly useful way to think about state. In a typical JavaScript program, you might have lots of mutable state all over the place, variables and objects that can be changed, and it can be very hard to track down where all the state changes happen. In ClojureScript, state changes are always very explicit. You know exactly where they're happening, and they're usually isolated to a few small areas of your code. It can make programming much, much simpler. So again, ClojureScript is a compiler. It compiles ClojureScript into JavaScript. Now why would we want to do that? Well, it turns out it does a pretty good job of it, in part because of this extra little piece called the Google Closure Compiler. Now, the naming here is a little unfortunate. There's Closure, which is a language on the JVM, Closure Script, which is a version of Closure that compiles to JavaScript. Then there's Closure with an S, which has absolutely nothing to do with it, but ClojureScript uses Closure with an S. The two projects didn't know anything about each other for the record, our Closure came first. So the Google Closure compiler is an optimizing JavaScript compiler. It takes JavaScript as input and returns optimized JavaScript as output. And along the way, it can do very sophisticated whole program optimizations of a JavaScript program to optimize it for both execution time and space in download size. So just to give you an idea of just how good this optimizer is, here's a simple example. I wrote a JavaScript function there and the Google Closure compiler can run in three different modes. White space mode is similar to, you know, a typical very naive JavaScript minifier. It just strips out the comments in the white space and stuff. Then there's a mode called simple, which will do some very basic optimizations. Probably most JavaScript minifiers can do things like this. It renames the function arguments, it removes some of the intermediate variables, but it doesn't fundamentally alter the structure of the code. But where it really takes off is advanced mode. Advanced mode the Google Closure compiler can basically rewrite your entire program to something significantly shorter that's going to have the same effect. And 
I am constantly amazed when I see this. This is probably one of the most sophisticated open source compilers out there right now. Um, it basically saw that I was calling this function only once with constant arguments. So it says, okay, I'll just inline the whole thing, evaluate it at compile time and return the code that you meant that does what you meant. So the Google Closure compiler is very effective at optimizing JavaScript output from the closure script compiler and making it very small and very efficient. The other thing it does is something called dead code elimination. So similar to here how it eliminated the do stuff function, if I hadn't called the do stuff function at all, it just would have removed it entirely. So any code in your program that's dead, that's not getting used in the main flow of the program, if it can determine that, it'll just strip it out entirely. And this has some very interesting advantages when you're delivering an application over the web and you have limited bandwidth because you could take in a whole huge library of code. For example, the Google Closure compiler comes with its own libraries that are many, many megabytes in size. But you only pay for what you use. If you're not using some functionality or some function, it's not going to be there. So this is a very different approach from what a lot of current JavaScript development is doing where people are trying to make hand-optimized libraries that are very small. And they do a very good job of that, but they're still limited because if you want to use, say, jQuery, you're getting all of jQuery, whether or not you're using all of the features that it provides. ClojureScript is also fairly efficient it can get very close to hand-optimized JavaScript. Here's an example. This is a spectral normalization benchmark. It's from the Alioth uh, computer benchmark game. I won't pretend to understand what this code does, but you can see it's got lots of tightly nested loops. It's using the typed arrays that are a new feature in ECMAScript 6. And it's just doing a lot of mathematical computation. Now the same code in ClojureScript doesn't really look that different. David Nolan mo wrote most of this and I adapted it. You can see we've got loops, arithmetic, some uh, arrays. We can create the same uh, primitive array types that we can use in native JavaScript when those features become available. The JS slash is a special namespace that tells the compiler that this thing exists in JavaScript. It wasn't created in ClojureScript. So the code is not that different and it performs similarly. Now I will be honest here, David Nolan who wrote this example claims that he's got it running at the same speed as the original JavaScript code in the latest version of the V8 JavaScript engine. I personally have not been able to reproduce that, but I've gotten it quite close. And this is a very actively studied area. This is continually being improved. We keep finding new ways to make the compiler a little bit better, to emit code that modern JavaScript runtimes can execute very efficiently. And the other nice thing about ClojureScript is that it's still basically JavaScript. You have access to everything you have in JavaScript if you want it. So you can use JavaScript libraries, you can use jQuery, Raphael, whatever. There's a little bit of extra configuration at build time and those libraries will not necessarily get the benefits of the optimizing Google Closure compiler because they weren't designed for it. But you can still use them. You can call methods, you can create objects directly, and it'll all just work. There's no funny syntax you have to use. In fact, I have an example. This is the Raphael JavaScript library. This is a demo that they have on their site. Raphael is a vector graphics library for doing things like charts and graphs and so forth. And this is some very simple JavaScript code that draws a canvas and makes a little animated circle in the middle of it. I ported this to ClojureScript in about 15 minutes. It was not difficult. And you can see the code doesn't look all that different. I can create an instance of the Raphael object and I can call some methods on it to draw the canvas, draw the circle, and animate it. And just to prove that that works, 
there's a little animated circle. Unfortunately, I'm not much of a graphics guy or I would have come up with something much flashier than that. So where is this difficult? It's not always perfect. Where are we going to run into challenges working with ClojureScript? Now the first one that people always bring up, the question everyone always has is, how do you do debugging? What is it like to debug this generated code? You're an extra level of indirection away from what the browser is actually executing. And yeah, it's a little bit harder than debugging JavaScript that you wrote yourself, but it's not really that much harder. My coworker Jason Rudolph wrote a blog post demonstrating some examples of how he did debug a ClojureScript application that he was working on. So here's what it looks like. This is the WebKit debugger. This is Chrome and he found an error message. It said type error cannot call method call of undefined. So it tried to call a function that wasn't defined. Well, where did that happen? It happened in a namespace. That namespace is clearly indicated in the output JavaScript source code. Then we can find the function that it was happening in. We can see what got called on that line. So we know it's one of those calls in there that was the problem. We can trace that back fairly easily. There's a more or less a one-to-one -one correspondence between the JavaScript source code and the ClojureScript source code. So we can find what line in the original source had the problem and then figure out what the problem was. Oh, we called a function that doesn't exist. We mistyped the name. So, you know, it's not really that hard. It's basically the same process you'd go through debugging any JavaScript application. Another example is profiling. And again, it's not really that different from profiling and optimizing a JavaScript application. You can run any JavaScript uh, profiler or debugger. This example is using the WebKit profiler and you can just turn it on in code, run the profiler in WebKit, look at the call stack, find out, oh, this function is occupying 30% or so of my runtime, and then find instances in the ClojureScript code where I'm calling that function, and realize, oh yeah, that's printing a 30 kilobyte string to the log every few seconds. That's probably gonna slow the app down. So this is not really all that esoteric. You know, the generated code looks like something you can read. You can find the associations back to your source code and figure out what's going on. Finally, tooling. ClojureScript is a very young language. It was first released publicly in summer of last year, so it's a little over a year old. And admittedly, the tooling and sort of build development workflow support is still very much a work in progress. It's still evolving. But there are some things out there already that make it much easier to get started. Linegan is a build tool designed originally for Clojure and there's a plugin for it called Line CLJS Build. There's also a tool called the Browser Attached REPL, or as I like to call it, the BAT REPL, which is an interactive console connected to your application running in a browser. And if we have time, I'll show you an example of that. So here's what Linegan looks like. This is a build or project file for uh, a sample ClojureScript project using Linegan and Line CLJS build. You define a project, give it a name, I call this Java One Examples My Project, add in the CLJS build plugin, and then tell the CLJS build plugin how you want to build your JavaScript application. In this case, I'm telling it to compile to a single JavaScript file using the advanced mode optimizations and not including any white space or pretty printing in the JavaScript output. So those are both fun. Closure and Closure Script are great languages, but where they really start to shine, where you really get to have fun with this, is when you combine them. When you put a Closure web server communicating with a client application written in Closure Script 
running in the browser. All of a sudden, you can share data back and forth between a server and a client in the native format of the language. Every data structure in Clojure and ClojureScript can be printed to a string. It has a string representation. Then you can read that string back and get the, the actual data structure representing that string. So this is now called extensible data no notation. It's sort of an answer to JSON, but it's much richer than JSON. You saw we had, in addition to the standard lists and maps, we had maps that could take arbitrary keys, we have arbitrary precision numbers, and this has also been implemented in a few other languages, so now you can exchange this data with any language for which there's an EDN reader, and there are several of them now. Another really neat thing about EDN and about the literal syntax of Clojure and ClojureScript is this thing called tagged literals. Now this is a way of specifying a type for a value independent of its in-memory representation. So an example that's built in to Clojure and ClojureScript now is inst for instant. Inst is a tag, it's written that way, hash sign, I-N-S-T, and then a string. The format of the string is rigidly specified. It has to be in that ISO format. But any particular implementation is free to choose how it wants to represent that instant. So on the JVM, I can represent that as a Java util date, or a Java util calendar, or a Joda date, or whatever type I'm using in my application. And in JavaScript, or in ClojureScript, it'll be read as a JavaScript date. So what this means is, we can have well-defined typed information that has different class names or different concrete implementations in a client and a server. So think of all the times you might have had to put something in a string because that was the only format that both ends understood. This happens a lot in JSON. Everything gets turned into a string and you have to remember when you get it at the other end to turn it back into whatever the correct type is. With tag literals, it just happens automatically. Another really neat thing you can do is share code between the client and the server. This is, I think, one of the very few languages that can actually do this right now. We can write the same piece of code, say, data validation, a model, some you know, templating logic even, and we can compile it once for closure, run it on a web server with you know, multiple threads and all the performance of the JVM, then compile it again as closure script, and it'll just work. Everything will work. Any code that's just manipulating those data structures, which as I said, is the bulk of what your code will do, anything that's not calling the host platform, so thing, there's things that are not calling methods on native types or calling constructors of native types, you can just work. So it's very easy to port code between Clojure and ClojureScript. Frequently it's automatic. Fairly soon I expect we'll have something called feature expressions, which is basically some extra syntax that will make it possible to write the same source file and include different variations for Clojure and ClojureScript. So then you actually can have the same source file that will be compiled in a compatible way for the two different platforms. So that's pretty much all I have here. I've got some slide notes there. I don't generally distribute slides themselves, but a copy of all of the source code and all of the links that I included in this presentation is available there. There are some other conferences where I'll be speaking. And this slideshow itself is actually a ClojureScript application. It's uh, tied in with Emacs org mode, so it's kind of a special case, but it's very useful for me. And finally, I have a book coming out with Luke Vanderhart from O'Reilly called ClojureScript Up and Running. This is available in beta early release now online, and it'll be in print soon. So I have about 10 minutes for questions, and thank you for coming. Question. Can you target Node.js? Yes, you can. Uh, there's an extra option to the compiler that emits a few extra things for Node.js. Not heavily used at the moment, but people have done it. <laughs>
Yes. Uh, as compared to some other lists, uh, there's some, a lot of stuff in Clojure that's kind of an artifact of the fact that it was written for the JDM. I'm thinking about like the tail version. Yeah. So it's, I mean, those restrictions really aren't there in JavaScript. Uh, is there a possibility that, I mean, how, how important is compatibility with the JDM version? So uh, the question is, how important is it for ClojureScript to maintain compatibility with the features of Clojure that were sort of forced by the JVM? In particular, the fact that Clojure does not have automatic tail call optimization as some lists do, because turns out you can't actually do that efficiently on the JVM. Clojure does have something called recur, which lets you get most of the effects of tail call optimization. So the answer is uh, Clojure script is designed to be the same language as Clojure. So it will probably retain some of those features. One I know right now is try catch in Clojure script uses types for exceptions because that's how try catch is defined in Clojure on the JVM. There may be some loosening of those restrictions, especially once we get feature expressions so that we can distinguish the types. Uh, recur will probably stick around. I think there's some argument that that's valuable as a, as a safety check. But in general, both languages try to embrace the host platform as much as possible, and they try to not prevent you from getting at any of the features of that platform. So that's the best answer I can give you. Yes? Can you tell us a few real world examples of what you have done with Clojure Script? Real world examples of Clojure Script. Well, this slideshow. Um, uh, so I work at Relevance. It's a consulting company. We have done client projects in Clojure Script. I don't have uh, anything publicly demoable that I can show you, but we have been using it on projects. It's been a lot of fun to work with, and I know certainly other people are either seriously investigating it or starting to use it. But again, it's still a very young language. People are just starting to try it out. Any more questions? Yes. So the question is, how long does it take to compile with all of these different stages, including the uh, Google Clojure compiler? The Google Clojure compiler takes a while. Um, even a fairly small application will take 20 or 30 seconds to go through the optimizer, but that's in advanced mode. And you don't need to run in advanced mode when you're developing. So line CLJS build, I'll see if I can show this actually has uh, an auto mode. So if you can see that, this is compiling some sample code and if I change one of my source files, and save it, you'll see it recompiles it in less than a second. So the Clojure Script compiler is fairly quick. If once you want to go to production, you're invoking the, Clojure, the Google Clojure compiler, it takes a bit longer. Yeah. Any more questions? Yes. Do you have input of the maintainability of the program written on this code versus JavaScript? Uh, you're asking what, what's the maintainability? Maintainability of JavaScript when you have a lot of code written in JavaScript with a large team with different levels of knowledge. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to maintain. Right, right. So the maintainability, I think, in Clojure is actually much easier 
than in JavaScript, partly because you have these features like namespaces. You have things that were actually designed for working with larger applications. Are there plugins for IDEs? I don't know if there are any plugins explicitly for Clojure Script. All of the Java IDEs have Clojure plugins, however. And since the syntax is the same, the highlighting and stuff will still work. Yes. So why not JSON when communicating between Clojure and Clojure Script? You can use JSON. It's there. There are JSON readers and parsers written for both uh, Clojure and Google. The Google Clojure library has one that you can use from Clojure Script. The basic reason is that what you're going to end up translating it into is the native data types of Clojure Script and Clojure anyway. So there's sort of a an impedance mis mismatch with JSON because JSON is sort of limited to the lowest common denominator of what every programming language in the world can do, which is just arrays, strings, numbers, and maps with string keys. EDN can do a much richer set of data types that might be easier to represent the data in your application. Questions? Anyone? All right, thank you all for coming. I'll be around. <laughs>